is no one thing we can say about Chautauqua. Truly, the very essence of Chautauqua is complexity. Now, it reminds me a bit of the story of the blind men and the elephant. And an elephant came into the city. Some blind men were there. They wanted to feel an elephant because they'd never had the chance before. So one man went up. He felt the leg. And he said, oh, it's like a tree trunk. And another man went over and he felt the trunk and he said, no, no, you're, you, I don't know what you're talking about, it's more like a snake. And another man felt the side of the elephant and said, no, no, it's like a wall. Well, it's the same thing as Chautauqua. Even people who have been here all their lives tend to have experienced one side of it. Very difficult to get beyond that. And the only way to do it, I think, really is through other people. To get around that, to get a more complete picture of what's going on. But there is no underlying essence, principle. You can try various ways to organize all the programming that's going on. It's very difficult to put a handle on it or to simply explain to somebody what Chautauqua is about. In fact, when I talk to audiences that don't know about Chautauqua for the purpose of trying to get them to come here, that's one thing I do not do. It's overwhelming or it begins to sound very trivial. When you go through the list of the speakers and the entertainers, well, it almost sounds, you know, like um, Darien Lake or something. You know, it, it really gives the wrong impression. Uh, and instead, what I try to do is just throw out enough that they will be curious enough to come and see the place uh, for themselves. Now, I know when I first came, it was quite confusing. My wife and I and my two kids after we finally figured out how to get into the grounds. That was the, the first problem that we had. When we finally figured that out, we both felt that we had somehow walked onto the set of the Twilight Zone. Or, you know those Soviet camps, those are the spy camps they used to have to train Soviet spies, supposedly? to how to be American, so they could then fit in. That's what we had perhaps stumbled on. Right? And being from the city, when you walk around and you see people with nothing to do, smiling at you, you just figure they're lobotomized. <laughs> and it took a bit of getting used to what this place was about. The first thing that helped was we found out it was not a utopia. It was not what? That helped. It was not a utopia. Oh, right. We found out it's not really a town. Yes, it has a post office, and but once you get over that, you're on the right track. Once you start then looking at the variety of programming, various things that are going on, you begin to relate to one piece or another. For me, it was the music shacks. It's the first time I started to feel comfortable because I understood that. I understood a music camp. And then I went to the art squad. That was pretty good, too. And started working my way through and eventually could encompass uh, much more of the grounds. But I mean, you don't do it that quickly, that's, that's for sure. It is important, as I say, when we come to the crossroads, and I mean these crossroads seem to be going on a long, long time, that we know who we are, that we know what Chautauqua is. We know it's an idea, as Vincent describes. We know it's a place. Something Vincent didn't think was that important. You know, Vincent said, someday this place will be shut down. The grounds will close up and everything. It won't matter. Chautauqua will still go on because the idea will go on. Well, he was kind of wrong. The idea, which he meant the movement, did decline and really kind of die out. The place here kept it alive, but kept it alive here. That's one of the things we'll look at in the talk. But it's more than just simply an idea and a place, it's also a community. It's through the community that you have the continuity. It goes all the way back to the beginning, the first assembly, and it's what's going to carry on. And it's in that community and the identity of that community that we need to take a look. And the best way to do that is to take, I think, another look at its history. Well, you all know it started as a normal school for Sunday school teachers. That is a school to teach teachers. John Vincent uh, was in charge of the Sunday school curriculum for the Methodist Church, a curriculum that was followed by many of the mainstream Protestant churches of the day. 
And he began holding these two-week schools in various locations around the country. This was not the first. And he approached Lewis Miller, who was superintendent of the Sunday school program in Akron, uh, wishing to use a building that he had designed known as the Akron Plan. This was a, a, uh, had a center meeting area with various classrooms around the side, perfect for the graduated approach to Sunday school teaching that they were advocating. But Lewis Miller said he had a better idea. He said, I don't need to tell you who Lewis Miller is and all that, and you all know that. He said, let's take it to the woods, and suggested that they come here to Fairpoint, where there existed the camp meeting grounds already that had been in operation for three years. And Lewis Miller was on the board of directors of that camp meeting association. First, Vincent was a little apprehensive because he was afraid that by having it out in the country, it would become a camp meeting. They would lose control. So right from day one, they had a great deal of control. It was gated, as were many camp meeting assemblies. But the program was so tightly controlled and so complete and full, it occupied a person's time throughout the whole day. And nothing happened. You weren't allowed to get together and pray or sing a hymn or do anything at all without the permission of the committee. But he was attracted to the idea of getting out of the city. He did believe it might be a better environment to go to, into a natural setting and there, away from the, the distractions of the world, and seeing more a world that worked together and pulled together, it was a better atmosphere in which to try to focus a very intensive two weeks of study. Well, the experiment of 1874 proved to be a great success. And quickly, it grew into more than a normal school for Sunday school teachers. It really became an extension of the Sabbath itself. John Vincent would later say that Chautauqua was all about the Sabbath. Because at Chautauqua, every day was the Sabbath. Just as Sunday was a day of rest for the week, the way Vincent saw it is that Chautauqua would provide a time of rest for the year as a whole. Chautauqua was all about the good use of leisure the proper observance of those hours and minutes of rest ordained by God for our benefit. As President Garfield would say, it has been the struggle of the world to get more leisure, but it was left for Chautauqua to show us how to use it. During the Gilded Age, that is the period that followed the Civil War, so named by Mark Twain, there was more leisure and more money in more hands than ever before. And the answer how this time should be used and this money should be spent would lay the foundation to modern American culture in the 20th century. <coughs> the improper use of leisure and the perceived violation of the Sabbath was a serious concern to church leaders in America following the Civil War. In 1872, the General Conference of the Methodist Church reminded its members to avoid certain amusements including horse racing, circuses, drinking, and dance lessons. And Vincent, too, was aware of the dangers free time and free money could pose, especially to the youth. In 1889, Vincent wrote a book simply titled, Better Not. And he listed four amusements to be avoided. Now, he explains clearly that these are not strictly forbidden by Scripture, but argues that reason and experience shows they carry consequences that endanger our physical and moral well-being. The first of these was drink. Now, the first national temperance co convention was organized at Chautauqua during the first season. And from that time on, everything Chautauqua did was in support of temperance. Alcohol was believed to be the root to virtually all evils in society. Without drink, it was believed that crime, domestic violence, unemployment, and poverty would vanish. And for this reason, activities associated with drinks such as card playing, dancing, and theater going were to be avoided no less. Now, regarding card playing, Vincent warned that no good could come of it. 
He especially wished to warn young women to be careful. They would not have the respect of young men if they took up such games, and added that any man who mar married a girl while aware of her moral weakness had already taken the first step towards divorce. As for dancing, there was no problem with very young children dancing or old couples on special occasions, <laughs> provided that they did not do so for too long. <laughs> there was much danger during the years between. Dancing, he wrote, was merely the rattle on the snake. The real danger was in the bite. And he agreed with the opinion that dancing, and I quote, cannot be participated in the heat and glare of the ballroom with the accessories of music and motion with the close physical contact and the hot breaths on each other's cheek without intoxicating the brain and setting the passions of the participants on fire. It is physiologically impossible. Any intelligent and honest physician will tell you so. <laughs> and finally, there was the theater. Vincent quoted Dr. Herrick Johnson, who wrote that the theater made one, I quote, familiar with the play of criminal passive passions. It exhibited woman with such approaches to nakedness as can have no other design than to breed lust behind the onlooking eyes. It furnished candidates for the brothel, and it was getting us used to scenes that rival the voluptuous and licentious ages of the past. He went on to say that if anyone doubted the consequences that were sure to follow, well, they should visit Naples. Visit Naples. Naples. Mm -hmm. There were some who felt that Christians should make a point of at attending the theater in order to raise its moral standards, but Vincent believed that this was pointless. He said that the number of Protestants living in the big cities constituted too small a portion of the general population to make any difference. What is more, he doubted that there could ever be such a thing as good theater. And again, he quoted Dr. Johnson, the ideal stage is out of the question, just as pure, chaste public nudity is out of the question. That is, with men and women as they are now constituted. <laughs> I don't know what changes to the constitution of men and women he had in mind, but I don't think they've after taken the place fall, yet. John. What? After the fall. After the fall, gotcha. <clears throat> but we must not conclude, as has been by some, that Vincent and the other founders of Chautauqua were in any ways opposed or fearful of leisure time itself or its pleasures. Rather, Vincent wrote, to Chautauqua all things hold the measure of God's wisdom. Things secular are under God's governance and are full of divine meanings. If God created all things, if he governs all things, if the channels of history have been furrowed by his own hand, if the beating life of the physical universe is from him who is life before life, life of all life, then nothing is secular in any sense as to make it foreign or unattractive to the saints of God. Or as Lewis Miller wrote, there must come to the common citizen, if justice is to be done, more leisure, more pay, more knowledge, more pleasure. These men and the other leaders of Chautauqua did not wish to limit leisure, but to co-opt leisure to Christ's service and thereby bring about the fulfillment of God's purpose for us and for our country. But, having gone over what we shouldn't do, what was left to do? To learn. <coughs> and learning from the start became the primary focus of how to use your leisure at Chautauqua. This was not only consistent with the Methodism of its founders, it was truly inspired by it. Following a Calvinist belief, really, in a total commitment to Christ, 19th century Methodists strove to find a way to break down the distinction between the sacred and the profane, the religious and the secular. Knowledge, knowledge of God, knowledge of mankind, and knowledge of nature were essential to a Christian understanding and a Christian character. It was really religion at Chautauqua that pushed the envelope to encompass all human activity <coughs> and experience. It was not a desire to leave religion behind, or a desire to move beyond religion, or a general tendency among people attending of being bored or tired with religion. 
it was really a religious perception and conviction itself which pushed them on to try to incorporate a broader knowledge of the human experience and of the world. As the founders said, religion was the vessel of knowledge. Without knowledge, religion was void and empty. But without religion, knowledge was formless and meaningless. Religion alone could provide the lens through which to see the world. Through education, the modern Christian would be protected from the confusion brought on by rapid change and discovery, and at the same time, with a strong faith, be able to guide that change in the correct direction. But Vincent Miller understood that not all learning was education. Education is guided learning, learning that is built layer by layer, eventually establishing a context for a broader, universal understanding. And this requires structure. So in addition to courses offered at Chautauqua, they devised a year-round correspondence reading program for people to acquire the equivalent of a college education by reading in their spare time. This pro program, called the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, the CLSC, was launched in 1878. It was a four-year course that covered all subjects that would be typically covered by a college course of study. When asked if this approach was not superficial, Vincent replied that all education was superficial in that it led one to scratch the surface and look deeper. True education went on for a lifetime and even beyond. As Alice Palmer said, the character of Chautauqua's training has been that it has made us wiser than we were about the things that last. And just as human experience was worth, uh, all human experience was worthy of study, so were all people worthy to be students, no matter what religion, race, sex, and here's the one that I believe is the most important of all, age. The CLSC was the first opportunity many had for such an education. It filled a need for higher education felt by those wishing to obtain it to begin life, as well as those who were frustrated by never having had the opportunity. Women, freedmen, those living in remote regions, or simply too poor or too busy with work and responsibilities to continue their education, could now be educated in their own spare time. Neither Vincent nor Miller had been able to attend college, and both were anxious to provide the means for all people to attain the same level of education. In conjunction with the CLSC, Chautauqua expanded its summer school courses William Rainey Harper, who was later the founding president of the University of Chicago, was made dean of the Chautauqua School. The opportunity of learning outside the regular school year was especially important for teachers. While only a thousand students could attend Chautauqua during a given summer, hundreds of thousands could be reached by teaching teachers. By expanding the curriculum, and by reforming the methods of teaching, primarily in keeping with the principles of Pestalozzi, the reform that was going on throughout the country at the time. And what that reform were graduated classes, hands-on learning, standardized curriculum, and normal school training. All of these regular features of <coughs> the Chautauqua training. It was here at Chautauqua that Sherwood taught his system of musical training to teachers and that the manual and fine arts were taught to teachers. And the first certificate in physical education was offered to those wishing to coach the youth. Chautauqua was also a pioneer in preschool education, one of the earliest institutions to provide formal training and certificates for kindergarten teachers. There were, of course, other attractions that brought people here. It was a safe environment. There was the lake. There was the relatively high altitude, although we bent over how it's not the highest lake, etc. <laughs> it was mosquito free. And we still don't know why. But very important that it is. And with the absence of drinking and the high moral standard of the area, women felt safe. They felt safe to go out. They felt safe to leave their children. And husbands <coughs> could leave their wives and children and go back to the city to work 
knowing that they were safe here. And while they were in the city, they could smoke and they could drink and they could do all of the things that they wouldn't be allowed to with while their wives were there. And it was regarded as an excellent environment for young girls to meet young men. But to keep people coming back and to compete with other vacation sites, the institution found it necessary to add new attractions continually, including even a roller coaster, <laughs> which was built uh, behind where Norton Hall now stands. The Royal Scooter had a track of 500 feet and its car reached a speed of 80 miles per hour. Now you'll notice that the people, you probably can't see it from that far away, the people here are sitting facing into the middle as they go around the track. They don't look down the track the way we typically do in a roller coaster today. The reason for that is there were no seat belts. And the centrifugal force held you in your seat mm -hmm. as you went around the loop. What was the years? What, what, do you know the years of that? No. What do you think? Hmm? What, when, what would your guess be? 1890, 1910. 1885. It was fairly early. Now, tickets were 25 cents. You got 10 rides around. What would happen is you, you, you'd go right around here. Once you got up to here, they would grab you and push you around for your second, and oh, until you went around 10 times. <laughs> and it was, I'm sure, fun. The trouble is that after you've done it enough times, it gets a little tedious. It was up for three years, and they took it down. And it appears then at Celeron, doubtless the same one. I mean, it's the same yeah. patent, the same name, everything else. Yeah. And built at Celeron, where it stood for many years, even after it uh, was no longer in use. The trouble with this approach was that you had to spend all that money to invest in this new entertainment, this new amusement. And then people just wanted something else. They just wanted something more. You had to keep giving people something new and something more to get them to keep coming back, but then you had to take that money and use it to buy more stuff for them to come back next year. And they just wanted more and more, and where was this getting you? And eventually this has to come down, and hopefully you can sell it, but otherwise it'll just break down, wear out, and as the capital expenditures increases, the capital depreciation becomes more of a problem year after year. Where can you get the money to keep this going? William Duncan, who was the uh, superintendent of the grounds and uh, treasurer of the institution at the time, took over this problem when the, inst when the assembly almost went bankrupt in 1883. And he was able to match the expenditures directly with the income of that year so that they could slowly get out of debt but at the same time never it, it spend more than what was actually coming in. But that too only worked for say 15 years before the expenses involved in the building became more and more of a problem. And then what appears but the use of Old First Night as a fundraiser. Originally the gate pass was something to make everybody equal. Everybody bought their tickets, or everyone's on the same footing with everybody else. There was no real fundraising. Then people offered gifts. Then the next step was the assembly, or soon to be the institution, asked for those gifts in order to get enough money to pay for a program that would keep the gate out that the gate could no longer afford on its own. Does this sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> I think anyone that certainly was on the board has probably never heard this sort of scenario. Well, its roots go way back. So it's interesting to see how this has been dealt with uh, over time. And I'm much more comfortable talking about how it was dealt with 100 years ago than how it's being dealt with right now for obvious reasons. <laughs> Most of all, though, this sort of amusement could be obtained elsewhere with greater variety and at a cheaper cost. This could not compete with other fairgrounds. 
we had something different. And we soon learned we were much better off staying to what we were good at, what made us unique. Again, getting back really to our identity, or in this case, discovering our identity. One of the ways we describe this essential program at Chautauqua is with the four pillars. Just so you know, the four pillars is not an old idea, it's a recent idea. It's a very recent idea, very recent way of describing it. But it does apply all the way back to the beginning of Chautauqua. The four pillars, of course, education, art, recreation, and religion. It's not surprising that the popularity of this program, the use of one's leisure time, and the learning how to use one leisure, one's leisure time, attracted not only the same people back year after year, but new people, and it included, of course, many famous people and many wealthy people, such as, of course, Thomas Edison, probably the biggest name that ever I was a regular here at Chautauqua, and as you all know, Mary, Mine Edison, daughter of Lewis Miller, etc. And with him came his friends, uh, Ford and Firestone. But I'm not going to give the list. You know what the list is. Uh, there are so many industrialists of the past and even present names that are recognized as being regular attendees at uh, Chautauqua. Now, there are also presidents. When, and the first of these presidents to come was uh, President Grant in 1875, quite a coup. Miller uh, had connections with the Republican Party, et cetera, but it was really Vincent uh, that was able to, to have uh, Grant come because Grant had been a parishioner of his back in Illinois. Before Grant was ever famous, before Vincent was ever famous, Two men knew each other and they had kept in touch. Grant thought very highly of John Vincent. So he managed to have him come. Now, I have to be honest about this picture though. When I came, I was shown this picture and I was told this is a picture of President Grant visiting Chautauqua, about to enter the Miller Cottage, which was built that summer, largely in order that he would have a place to stay. And this is President Grant. Well, I have to be honest. That is not President Grant. <coughs> if you look more carefully, that is Lewis Miller. And in fact, this is Lewis Miller's birthday that's being celebrated. Well, there were some people in the archives who didn't like that. So they said, you know what? I think I can date this photograph and prove that you're wrong. Now, how could you date a photograph like this? Flag. The flag. There you go. Now, I'm going to use a special program that I put on the laptop to enhance that image, all right? Don't try to do this at home. <laughs> we'll find that on close inspection, the flag is 1867. And that is the flag used in 1875. They argued it's too early for it to be a later birthday for uh, Miller. I forget which one, I think it's like, uh, 70 or something. So they said, therefore, this must be President Grant. Mm -hmm. However, if we look at this flag, <laughs> and I'll use the same software package there too. 1877 flag is flying there. One warning, when you're dating pictures from the 19th century, you can't use flags <laughs> as, a, a, I mean, you can, you can use them one way. If, if it's 1877, you know it's got to be 1877 or later. But you, people didn't throw out their flags. And we went through a lot of flags in those days. So that you will see many photographs with several flags, several generations of flags on display. In fact, that flag proves it can't be uh, President Grant visiting Chautauqua. At any rate, we also had Rutherford B. Hayes. Is there, okay, don't cut your killing us. Is there any pictures? <laughs> no. I do not have a picture. I wouldn't say there are no pictures. I have no picture. But you've never seen one. I've never seen a picture of Grant at Chautauqua. 
William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt on several occasions. That's at Chautauqua when he was governor. Robert William Taft. It would appear that Taft is standing on the far side. Um, Roosevelt, of course, on four occasions. Gerald Ford was here. And Speaker of the House uh, Bill Clinton was here as governor as well as a presidential candidate and as president. However, here's where we get to the rub. You're not president until you're president. <laughs> You don't say, President Washington, cut down the cherry tree. <laughs> you don't say, Sir Winston Churchill was a war correspondent in South Africa. You don't get these titles, you don't use them in history until the person acquires them. After they're, they've left the White House, sure, you can still call them president, but they have to be elected first. And if we use that rule, there were only five presidents who have been in talk. Grant, as president, Hayes, after he was president, Teddy Roosevelt, both as an acting president and as a former president, FDR as an acting president, and Clinton as an acting president, but only in the off-season. So there have only really been four in the season that have come, and fewer than that who have ever spoken. Now, for the presidents to be, that's Garfield, McKinley, Pat, Ford, and the other ones down there who later became president as well. The truth is, there are some brothels in Washington that have had more presidents visit <laughs> <laughs> Talk with trivia question. How many presidents have slept in the Athenaeum? <laughs> I've, heard, I've read nine. We know that can't be true. Are you talking about as they, when they were, when or after they were presidents, or at any time? As president or after, with the title president. One. 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 The main thing is, though, not how many presidents or inventors or um, wealthy, powerful people came. What was important is that the common person was attracted back. And they came back year after year because they loved Chautauqua. A little hard to see it from the photograph, I find, uh, of the day. But they actually had a very good time while they were here. <laughs> and um, this is where you have that attraction of these people coming back together is where you have the beginning of what is now the community. It's carried on. It's done the same thing. And some of these are your ancestors in some cases. But even if they aren't genetically your ancestors, the point is people were coming and forming a community because they knew other people were coming for the same reason. And that's what made it such a close-knit and exciting you see, much of the success of Chautauqua came from filling a vacuum that existed after the Civil War. It really combined the social attraction of the camp meeting with the edification of the Lyceum. And some of the people who had been very involved in the Lyceum movement, they're the ones that are going to spread Chautauqua through the Chautauqua movement later in their lives. They saw a second opportunity to carry on with that earlier work, but now in a different context, different setting, one that had borrowed so much from the camp meeting, which had fallen into disfavor, but yet there still was a need for it, uh, particularly in a rural setting. Well, in time, especially through the CLSC reading circles around the country, other uh, daughter Chautauquas sprung up across the country and making this one the mother should talk with. We know that there were at least 255 such daughter should talk with across North America. <clears throat> what I can make out is that the talent agents that provided the speakers and the performers for this should talk with, as well as the other should talk was defined what would then be called should talk with talent. What they started calling should talk with talent. <clears throat> and I get that from the letters written to George Vincent 
from these agents who were in Boston, New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Cleveland. <coughs> what was Chautauqua talent? Well, it was an alternative. In those days, there was burlesque. Burlesque, though, was crude, rough. Um, there was a lot of sexual humor in it, inappropriate for children and women. So we get vaudeville. Now, vaudeville uh, cleaned up burlesque. It made it safe, something that even a family could go to. Later in the 1920s, some forms of vaudeville slip a little. But essentially, it starts out very much as a cleaned up form of entertainment for people. Well, Chautauqua went even further. Chautauqua was not only safe, Chautauqua entertainment was good for you. So starting in 1904, the agents that were producing this type of uh, talent began putting these performers on the circuits. Now they're called circuits because you didn't travel around like a circuit crew, where the whole bunch arrives at a town, sets up, and then they move to another town. Instead, there would be a setup crew. They would go on the very next day and set up somewhere else. Then these speakers come, they speak here, they get on a train, they, or a bus, or a car, or a wagon, or however the transportation was carried out. They go to the next spot while somebody comes behind them, and then they go on and somebody comes behind them, and they're spread out across a huge circuit covering thousands of miles. When most people think about Chautauqua, they're thinking about a circuit, because the circuits reached millions of Americans. They flourished uh, from the uh, from 1904 uh, into the 20s, and then uh, eventually ended in 1933 in the United States. In Canada, they continued on right up to the Second World War. Well, but well before the uh, circuits were on decline, Chautauqua had distanced itself from this movement, the movement it had actually inspired and started. The reason was largely the rift that was growing between an urban culture, rising middle class, and a rural way of life that was increasingly being threatened. Chautauqua really had always had more of an urban orientation. And uh, even in the way that it would sell coming to the country as a way of escaping the city reveals uh, that urban uh, orientation that it had. Originally, in a largely agrarian society, when Chautauqua started, the use of leisure time for education and self-improvement was an egalitarian movement. Life was pretty rough at Chautauqua in the first years. And you can imagine the energy and the excitement that must have existed as people went through these conditions in the mud and the rain and the cold to learn Greek or to learn biblical geography. But over time, it moved upscale. Over time, it became more of an expression of this new growing class of Americans who in turn began to monopolize and define leisure. Leisure became more and more really the property of this new middle class. It wasn't so much that Chautauqua changed, in a sense it stayed the same while the rest of the world changed around it. And so they became more concerned about being identified with the circuits which they saw as being rubbish, efforts at education and wished instead a much more highbrow type of expression of their uh, culture. Well, there were other changes at work as well. Before the First World War, Chautauqua did not so much introduce people to new ideas as it put new ideas that people were already exposed to into a familiar, 
moral context. And this was done primarily by the use of biblical vocabulary. I'm going to read you a quote from 1903, a talk given by the Reverend Bashford discussing the question of what should be done with the Philippines after the Spanish-American War. Reverend Bashford said, you will remember that in the 15th century, possibly in recognition of the heroism and sacrifice of Ferdinand and Isabella, God gave to Spain the scepter of the world, and for years Spain was the greatest ruler on the face of the globe. But you must remember that Spain was bigoted and corrupt, and she let the scepter slip from her hands never to seize it again. You remember in the 16th century God gave to France, possibly as a recompense for her heroic missionary work in the New World, the scepter of the world. But France was proud and worldly, bigoted, selfish, ambitious, and on the heights of Abraham, France let the scepter slip from her grasp, never to seize it again. In the 18th century, God gave that scepter to England, yet England let it slip from her grasp in a measure never to seize it again. In the 20th century, God places that scepter in the hands of the United States, and if we let it slip from our grasp, we shall never seize it again. If the people of the United States have not the strength to trample their appetites underfoot, if we give way to the slavery of intemperance and lust, God Almighty will never call us to the rulership of the nations around. We must conquer ourselves before we can become the leaders and inspirers of the nations of the world. If we get to exploiting the Philippines simply for our own riches, assuming that God has made the Anglo-Saxon the rulers of the earth, we shall begin to commit the error which misled the Jews in olden times. We shall find as a people, if we talk, walk in sin and self-indulgence, that the Old Testament is not a last year's almanac. That we are living in a universe of law, and God will not abolish or set aside the laws of the universe to accommodate Americans. If on the other hand we seek to follow in the footsteps of our Master Jesus Christ, if it becomes our ambition to save and not to rule, if we can stand for righteousness among the people of the earth and for love and service to those who are downtrodden, we shall walk in the footsteps of Christ and no more fail in our providential task than he can fail. You can see the biblical analogies, the biblical language, in a sense why I like to say the biblical vocabulary used to describe the questions that they are facing now so as to make them understandable and so as to make it clear what direction the United States should take and what otherwise could be very complex and confusing issues which were being presented through a wider range of media and sources of information. But after World War I, a disillusionment overtook the institution. Suffrage was accomplished. Women had the vote. That was supposed to clean up all political corruption, uh, raise the standards of government, uh, end all wars, if only women had the vote. Wars? Yeah. <laughs> Abol uh, abolition came in, uh, prohibition came in, with a, uh, making illegal sale of alcohol. All the social problems were to disappear. Crime was to stop. Whoops again. They succeeded in their two major elements of their agenda with utter disappointment in the 1920s. The First World War did not accomplish the international order that had been hoped for. Instead, people saw the rise of fascism, communism, anarchy. It wasn't so much that Chautauquans lost faith in God, but they did lose faith in the world. And they came to turn more to art rather than religion as a medium by which to understand a confusing and apparently pointless world. Now the shift of concentration towards the arts, along with a growing sense of class status and an increasing focus on Chautauqua now as a place, led to a significant increase in expenditure on the grounds and the buildings as well as the programs themselves. So much so that with the decline in revenues brought on by the crash of the market and later by the depression, 
the institution fell into receivership in 1933. And you know, we've had presentations on how they got out of that debt. Let me just say quickly that through tireless fundraising, and you know what some of that was, sentimental ownership of trees, bricks, spaces of air, whatever, selling trees for presidential candidates, uh, uh, anything that could be sold was sold several times uh, in order to raise money. But most of all, they tried to have people buy their lease for, an for a percentage of the assessed value. This was not a shrewd real estate move. This was an effort to try to save the institution, realizing that if the institution went under, their cottages would be of little use to them, let alone of little value to them. So they, enough Chautauquans gave money, bought their leases, and in the end, we were actually saved with a last minute check from Rock the Rockefeller Foundation, of which George Vincent was the director, but also Mrs. Pennybacker, who was crucial for the success of this program of recovery, was very good friends uh, with the Rockefellers. They were able, in 1936, literally the 11th hour, to raise enough money to buy back their debt. From that time on, the situation was different. People now owned the land. Before that, you didn't own the land. You, you owned the building, but you, you leased the land on a long-term lease. Immediately, that made little difference, whether you had a long-term lease or you owned the land. In time, that made a huge difference. When we look at the rise of property values, and tax assessments. Mm -hmm. That creates a whole set of problems later in the 20th century that would not have existed had we stayed on this program. But it also led to the creation of the foundation. The foundation was separate from the institution so that the ins it was really started, I, in a sense, first by gifts from prominent Chautauquans, particularly Mina who wanted to make sure that her money would not simply be misused uh, by the institution as it was going bankrupt. They wanted to make sure that there was money set aside from the institution, independent, that would support the institution, but would be independent from the financial liabilities of the institution. So we have a foundation, and we have two entities now, we have two boards, and the foundation is there to ensure the existence of Chautauqua and to use money to help support the grounds and the programming at Chautauqua. And also after 36, we have a new era of conservatism financially. There is great caution exercised by the board determined not to get into the position that they had uh, in the 1930s where they nearly uh, lost the grounds altogether. Well, some people would say, I believe, um, that in fact there had been too much growth, too much building by Bester during his years as president. But the other side of it is, had Bester not built up the grounds to the degree that he had, I don't think there would have been a Chautauqua to save in 1936. And what's more, you would not have had the full program survive. But with the facilities we had, those facilities define what we do. It's not just what, what the place looks like. They define the type of activities we do, and they ensure that in the future we would go on doing them. And that is really what is most important about this place it's not that this is where it's all started, it's that this is the only place where the Chautauqua program is still carried out in its full form. Thank you. There was a time when dancing was prohibited, period. And, and, and they didn't want you going anywhere to do it. I mean, you, they, they warned you about dancing period, on or off the grounds. Um, they were very strict about what you did in your own cottage. 
uh, card playing, they would break in. If they if the suspected that children were, you know, teenagers or whatever, were playing cards, the Chautauqua police could break right in. And you could be thrown off the grounds for gamble, for playing uh, games of chance, for uh, possessing alcohol, not even drinking it. I mean, if it's just in your possession. Later, these rules loosen up. You can have it, but you can't drink it or whatever. You can play cards with only in your own house, and then you can drink it in your own house, etc. These rules change over time. Um, and it's interesting to see the Methodist Church struggling uh, from, the, the, say, the last third of the 19th century into the first third of the 20th century with how it should approach some of these moral issues. Uh, and recognizing that, there, that it wasn't essential to a Christian faith to refrain from these activities. How could they then insist on people adhering to them, but at the same time believing, as Vincent was saying, it's a good idea to avoid these things. So they wanted, on the one hand, to, to keep that teaching, and on the other hand, though they didn't want to exclude people. But for a while here, it was very strict. 